Welcome to Blue Collar Mystics, the under the hood approach to the depths of human consciousness. So many mysteries, so little time, so many big words. That's why we aim to take the mystical and make it practical, usable in your everyday life. And you know, we want to hear from you. We want to hear your story. What happened when you started asking yourself the real questions? Like, who am I? What is this? Is it a hologram? Is this some kind of weird cosmic joke? Hey, these are the questions that we are trying to get to the bottom of as we explore the final rabbit hole together here as Blue Collar Mystics. What's up, everybody? Welcome to this live stream. We're on a trans surfing safari, myself and Abby Johnson. Welcome, Abby. How you doing? I'm great. How are you? I'm doing great. I am. Uh, I've been getting ready to hit the road all day, doing laundry and cleaning the house and packing suitcases and stuff. And we were just talking a little bit about what your frustrations are being on the road as a bodybuilder, having to pack all your meals and figure all that out. I can only imagine. Oh, it's nuts. And then I, (laughs) last time I went to the airport to go meet with the secret society of good guys in real life. And when I went, I put all my protein and individual, so I wouldn't have to bring my scale, which I brought it anyway, but I put all my protein powder in individual baggies and usually nobody has any problem with it. Well, my bag beeps, right? So every individual bag, they have to swab because apparently um, protein powder ha- is like has something that's similar to ingredients in bombs. So then they had to swab my entire my entire bag, every single compartment. So, yeah, good thing I wasn't running late. Wow. But it's like you do all this footwork so that way you can eat all your meals like you because you're eating on a meal plan. You eat what you're supposed to eat all the time. You, so on top of laundry and packing all this other things, you do all that. And then, then it backfires. Yeah, that's hilarious, you know, (laughs) but, uh, but yeah, I don't know. It's probably one of my, uh, favorite, um, feelings to just be about to go somewhere, you know, embark on a new adventure. You're not really sure what's going to happen. You have some ideas, but there's going to be surprises and it's exciting. You know, my grandfather used to say before, like a big fishing trip, he would say like the anticipation is the best part. I hated it when he said that, (laughs) (laughs) but then I would just lay on the couch and have visions in my head of catching giant bass, you know, and then we would wake up the next morning at five 30, load the fishing, uh, boat up and stop by the gas station, get some mealworms and like a Yoohoo chocolate drink or something. And then we'd get out onto the lake and catch nothing. I, I remember, <laughs> I remember he, when the childproof lighters first came out and he got a childproof lighter from the gas station and he was a big time smoker and we got halfway out in, into the lake sit you know sit down he drops the anchor or whatever he sits he starts trying to light his cigarette and he can't figure it out (laughs) he just lost it fucking tossed the lighter in the lake and then we just went right back into shore dude (laughs) (laughs) yeah you gotta have a cigarette 
Oh, I mean, you don't go out into the middle of the lake for peace and quiet and not have a cigarette, right? Like if that, if hell no. Sober, oh my god. <laughs> no, I'm I'm really That's excited. Cool. I'm gonna be we're he- headed out. I'll be in Florida for a couple of days and then uh, over to New Orleans. And what I really want to try to do is make some videos while I'm out on the road. I'm gonna try and stop at this place that is supposedly the uh, Fountain of Youth, the old Fountain of Youth. It's like Ponce de Leon Springs in North Florida. So we're gonna stop there tomorrow, try and shoot a video and have that up. Try to shoot a video while we're at the beach, you know, and just try to make some fun content along the way and kind of engage on the tour uh as well so are you aiming for 25 in the fountain of youth or what no i'm just trying to stay here where i'm at just (laughs) i'm just gonna kick it level off we're good neutral 41 you know we're good right here i'm fine with that um yeah no i uh I'm excited. I've seen photos of it. It's absolutely a beautiful place. So I don't really know much about the lore of it, but I do know that it's like really pretty and it'll be a great backdrop to, uh, to shoot a video or two on. And if anybody has suggestions on topics or ideas for videos, shoot me a message. If you're going to be in new Orleans this weekend, shoot me a message. If you're going to the Grand America thing for the eclipse, Shoot me a message. If you're going to be in Austin on the 9th or 10th, shoot me a message. Or Houston on the 11th. Or Panama City on the 12th and 13th. I'm, we're kicking it off, Panama City, and then we're basically ending it there as well. So it'll be a lot of fun. Um, but anyway, yeah, I'm going to try to make the most of the time and make some fun, cool content posted up on the YouTube channel. So anybody has um ideas or suggestions i'm i'm all ears you know i'm here to i'm here to please but uh but yeah i've been making obviously a bunch of trans surfing stuff uh, i feel like you know there's some good videos i've been putting up lately um check into that stuff and uh i'll continue on that as a topic but i'll probably try to pick some more like nuanced things out. Perhaps this chapter that we're discussing today might be a really good option for a case study. (laughs) Are you going to practice it? A hundred percent. Yeah. And this is honestly, this chapter, what we're talking about today, which is like a a weird word, if you're unfamiliar with reality transferring, called frailing, is one of the more um, nuanced chapters and something that I definitely need to continue to practice. I have a couple of examples of this principle working in action, but it's something that I definitely need to understand better and get a, a clearer grasp of in, in the moment experientially, I would say. Same. I think, um, when I've read this chapter in the past, it wasn't that exciting to me. <laughs> so it was something that I'm like, okay, I get it conceptually wise and all of that. But like, I don't know. It just is the last, I was more excited about a lot of the other things. So yeah, I mean, my greater practices. Yeah, fair enough. And this is something that um, I think it's very helpful. It goes hand in hand with outer intention. So we're going to, we're going to break this down to the best of our ability. Um, obviously, we're all ears up here too, y'all out there in the chat. Appreciate y'all being out there. I see your comments. Thank you for hanging out and kicking it. Much love. And um, yeah, so don't don't uh, don't hesitate to chime in in there in the chat. You guys are great. Um, we definitely want to interact on this. But the idea, basically, uh, to start it all off, is frailing, which is like this weird word and nobody's ever heard, I don't think until this book, but he says earlier in the book that every soul has a frail or basically it's the shape of the soul. That's the way I could probably think of it. One of the specific sort of metaphors in this book is that we are like a suspended drop in the air of the ocean. And that's kind of what this incarnation is as a life form, as a human being in this, in this experience that we are like a drop 
of the ocean suspended. So we have these parameters that define us as our soul. We have a, a specific shape that our heart or soul is. And because of that shape, we have a personality. We are a specific and unique expression of the infinite of the divine. And in that form, uh, eventually we will once again rejoin the ocean. But while we're here in that form, we want to embrace the shape of that soul to the fullest. That's what's going to give us the maximum experience here, so to speak. And you know, it's ironic as I was, um, I was talking with chat GPT last night and I made it summarize the gospel of Judas for me from the Gnostic gospels. And that was one of the big takeaways is that you're a fractal of God. Like, so I thought it was kind of funny because it's the same idea, the whole droplet in the ocean thing. Yeah. I love that. There's that roomy quote too, that I probably quote way too much, but I love it so much. It's like, you are not a drop in the ocean. You are the entire ocean in a drop. And what Vadim says in this book is that what enlightenment is, is realizing that you are the ocean while you are also separated from it, which makes sense, right? And for our purposes, yeah. we're not trying to attain enlightenment or anything like that. We're just simply trying to attain our goal, which is the desire or the, the mission, you know, of our heart, you know, the, the thing that it, the thing that it is seeking that it wants that it's living here for. Cause like our heart can go and do what the hell ever in the dream space, no problem. And there's nothing off limits to it, but for some reason it wants to experience it in this fashion. You know what I mean? What's so funny. Oh, <laughs> I was just thinking about my dream last night. <laughs> I'm not getting into it. <laughs> okay, fair enough. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we want to express ourselves and have what it is that, that our heart wants that it came into the world for. And what this chapter is really about is understanding that everyone has that speci a specific shape, a specific uh, disposition, personality in its own reality. And, uh, and that everyone has their own desires. And by understanding that, we can kind of take that knowledge and for lack of a better way to say, leverage it, help them find what they're looking for. And by helping them find what they're looking for, we can also find or get whatever it is that we want as well. So on the surface, uh, it could be taken a, a few different ways. Um, you know, do on to others as you'd have them do on to you. That's a big uh, sort of thing. I, heard, I recently heard a comedian. I recently heard a comedian have the best take on that because he's like, you know, the Bible says to do on to others as you'd have them do on you. So he's like, I'm just going around giving everybody blowjobs. <laughs> like, that's what I'm doing. I'm just everyone. Period. Yeah. I'm like, that's hilarious. But, um, <clears throat> but the idea is a little bit more nuanced than just do nice things for other people for the sake of it, right? Like, He's saying, do onto others as they wish to have done onto them. And then you will get in return what it is that you would like yourself. Um, so, you know, that's more, that's more what this has to do. So there is a little bit of a <clears throat> twist in here. To me, this is like win-win. To me, frailing is like the micro and outer intention is like the macro. So it's like, this is how we can basically use outer intention in an individual way back and forth between us. Um, and so let, I'll try and give like a simple example, at least. So let's say that I'm hanging out with my sister and I really want to talk, you know, there, I've got some stuff on my chest. I really want to get it out. If I sit down and I let her talk and just get everything that she wants to get out, out and listen and be a true genuine ear for her, which is what I want ultimately is for her to be a genuine ear for me. If I give that, first to her and listen and uh and and let her get all the stuff out then when she finishes she will want to reciprocate and listen and give me what it is that i would like which is to be heard and and understood and and talk so from a simple perspective that's the uh that's one example of the idea of frailing um just yeah, to kind because of get it started. comes from the idea of 
every person is not when they're when they're interacting with you and thinking about you they're still really thinking about themselves yeah so we all do it you know you're thinking about how you know are they gonna do what i want are they gonna you know like me whatever it could be anything but they're kind of thinking the same thing so if they're doing that then the idea is with like in order to activate their inner or outer intention like to get them to see you from the heart and want to genuinely help you to accomplish your goals and your your missions or whatever um or just your goal with them is to find what is their frail what is their soul looking for and half the time it is just to be heard just to show them to be a good ear to listen and to genuinely show interest and come from the heart and in doing that it really just makes them soften to you and then ultimately want to help you do what you what you need yeah it's um it's a very um it's very interesting because we are all self motivated which is not a bad thing i think it's a great thing to just go ahead and acknowledge that right like you're not escaping the boundaries i mean maybe you can do astral projection or whatever but like you know you got to take care of your meat you know what i'm saying like you got to take care of your body and mm -hmm. uh, and things around you so we all have to be self-interested to it but that's why i like this book so much is because it's like an individualistic sort of approach to spirituality so what we're looking for here is not just give yourself and sacrifice yourself for the good of the the group because that's <clears throat> that's sacrificial you know we're looking for a win-win <clears throat> we want everybody to get what it is that they want and ironically the way to do that is not by asserting your needs first but by fi figuring out what other people need and then using that information to help them he even talks a little bit about visualization and stuff like that so everyone has let's distinguish a little bit between inner intention and outer intention uh so like uh inner intention being that you're going to take action you're going to sort of manipulate the world and push it around in order to get what it is that you want whereas outer intention you're sort of keying off the world and the alternatives flow kind of pinging and figuring out what the world needs in order to give that from what from what you have right like kind of looking for a win-win or really even a win-win-win would be ideal whereas inner intention is more like i win lose maybe win-win you know but often just des descends into more of a uh more of a needy and uh I would say you're less likely to get want from people if you're only concerned with yourself. I think that's right. I mean, yeah, yeah, you're yeah, exactly. You know, you're you're going to push. If you're acting with outer intention or inner intention. You're just pushing, and you're just when people push you, what do you want to do? Yeah, push back, resist. Yeah, yeah, push back. Yeah. yeah so <clears throat> you know, ultimately, everyone is. What he talks about in this chapter is that we're all we all are looking for self-worth at the basic level of our existence so by acknowledging someone's excellent traits by making them feel good about themselves by giving them you know a a, a good compliment that's fitting and suiting for the moment by uh acknowledging their strengths or uh, saying that they were right about something, you know, doing those types of things that makes them feel better about themselves and enhances their self-worth. And because that's coming from you, then they naturally sort of uh, tie you into that and not necessarily give you credit for it, but they associate you with that sort of bump in self-worth. You know, we're all looking for that. So it's always good to, and like he says in the seven habits of highly effective people, it's like seek first to understand, then to be understood. It's like it's always good if we can figure out how to validate someone else and especially their strengths, something that we admire about them that enhances their self-worth and they want to be around us more. You know, if you were around someone who was just talking about themselves all the time and how great they are, then you're going to get really annoyed really, really fast. 
But if you're around someone who brings out the best qualities in you, makes you feel comfortable, makes you feel special, makes you feel seen, then all you're ever going to want to do is hang out with that person and be around them all the time, you know? Yeah. He really gets into self-worth in this chapter too. And, um, he just talks about how when you're living in your self-worth and your authenticity that, you know, it is very attractive to other people and, and that's not the same as narcissism, you know, it's not even close. It's just, you know, when you're living with for your goal and your door and it's weird that he brought, I felt like it was weird because I felt like he brought up a lot of the energy stuff and everything too. And I, I didn't quite see what it had to do with frailing. It seemed like it was more a addition to the last chapter, but, but I guess really kind of what it comes down to is charm. So when you have good energy and your meridians aren't blocked and you're practicing your energy stuff to widen your meridians and, um, and you're living towards your goal and your door and then you practice frailing, you know, like your self-worth and everything shines through and it really is, is very charming and attractive to other people. And you can affect the energy of everyone around you. Yeah. It's like the firefly thing in Tufty where he's like, you know, talking about, um, being, being a source of light, you know, and the more that you connect heart and mind, the more charm you exude, the more you're actively like really being more authentically yourself and people feel comfortable around that and they're attracted to that and drawn to that. And, uh, that's, that's really where your heart and your mind are creating like a positive feedback loop where you you love your heart and your mind, your, you know, you, what, however he says it, like you love your heart with all your mind, but you have, you know, mutual adoration between the heart and mind. And that just exudes charm and starts to bring people, make people basically more endeared to you. Yeah. Um, he, he does talk about it in, romantic relationships slightly but i think it's more along the terms of attraction because if somebody's just there they're very like they want you to like them and or you want somebody to like you really really bad first of all you're put, you know you're putting off a lot of um excess potential there you know putting a lot of self-importance on it and then it's like you're probably coming off as an asshole really <laughs> instead of like what is this person like listen to them talk what do they like like what what are they looking for you know those type of things are more likely to get you in with the person and and start a mutual attraction than being all about yourself yeah i i have to say because he basically throws his hands up about the idea of like romantic love or mutual love ro whatever you want to call it and he's like, that's beyond the scope of this. You know, I don't have <laughs> the answers for that. And I'm like, ah, me either, buddy. Um, <laughs> fair enough. Uh, but yeah, join the club. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're not the only one. But that is what everyone, well, not everyone, but it is what a lot of people are looking for and interested in. Um, and we can talk about that. I, I would I would say that this chapter is more along the lines of learning to really establish more of a friend friendly relationship or <clears throat> a business relationship than it would be yeah. good practice for a romantic relationship. Yeah. But, and I think it's good to delineate because like, we'll go ahead and like kind of go off the rail and talk about this a little bit because um, I know somebody that you had interviewed a long time in the past who was an expert on reality transurfing talked about sex and that, in the, in the instance of sex that you should do frailing where you, and I thought it was really funny because then I found this article that Vadim Zeland wrote. It's not in any of his books that I know of, but it was on medium. I think it was, and it was specifically about sex. And he said, no, with sex, you never practice frailing. <laughs> and I was like, Oh really? So this person was wrong. I, I like when people are wrong. Yeah, <laughs> I yeah. like when experts are wrong. Um, <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> he said, nah, nah, dog. 
you don't do frailing in the bedroom. <laughs> That's you how he said Come sex. That's how he said it. He yeah. was like, nah, dog. He was like in his he said, thick Russian accent. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> sex <laughs> is an emotion and it's a feeling. So you need to embrace it and become it. So while you're having sex, in order to have really good sex and be really good in the bedroom, is to get out of your head, to not think about it, not think about the other person, and just become it. And I was like, ah. Oh. Well, that makes so much more sense to me. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely uh, some different elements that go along depending on the type of relationship you're establishing with someone. And so, yeah, so I, I do say to say like this particular chapter learning about frailing and really the whole book is more about, you know, professional relationships, friendships, stuff like that for the idea of this. I mean, of course, this comes in handy too. From finding your goal. Yeah, this comes in handy too if you're in a, you know, if you're in a romantic relationship. I don't want to make it I don't want to convolute anything, but but he does distinguish very much between like uh, love and sex too, you know, like love being something that is uh, very much different than like primal, let's call it attraction. Um <clears throat> that's something that's definitely uh, those two things are not really the same thing it's hard to it's hard to lump them together i'll just say that. yeah it is <laughs> yeah because <clears throat> yeah so one is so much more primal and instinctual and the other is more i would say like uh just conscious and higher on the level of awareness spectrum you know and both of them are valid and relevant and i think we all want to uh get both of those sort of going at the same time somehow, which uh, they are very much uh, paradox between the two elements. But just throwing that out there, that this is really not written about finding your twin flame. Okay. If you're going to try and, <clears throat> you know, meet your, <clears throat> your person or whatever, uh, or have a, or have a relationship that has, cause you need polarity in most romantic relationships, this particular chapter and really the book itself is probably not the best guidebook for that. There's probably other stuff that you could uh, look into. This is more like how to find ways to accomplish your goal while also helping other people accomplish theirs. So what is their inner intention? <clears throat> if you fulfill their inner intention, you are actively using outer intention in order to meet your own goal. So I'm going to try to think of some more examples of this. And I would love to hear anybody's examples. If they have experienced this phenomenon called frailing in their life. And I'll give one example. When I first read this book, I ran into the Bell's grocery store down here. And my grandmother, who's no longer with us now, but she was quite a, quite a character loved her very much uh she needed some grapes and like some hard candies you know grandma candy and uh <clears throat> and so she sent me over to the grocery store and i went and got those couple of things and i just went and grabbed them real quick i was kind of in a hurry I had something else to do whatever so i'm walking up to the checkout line and i'm about to check in and then there's a lady here just walking up at the same exact time of me as me and she's got a full grocery cart full of stuff just packed to the hip you know all the way what six hundred dollars worth of groceries now in 2024 it would have been maybe 75 dollars worth back then when this happened but we both get there at the same time <clears throat> i look at her she looks at me i've got two things in my hand she's got a a, a cart full of stuff and i go go ahead like I just waved her on <laughs> to go before me. And then I think she just saw the absurdity of the situation that I had given her <laughs> the thing that I wanted, which was to get the hell out of there. And she goes, no, you go ahead first, you know, and she kind of laughed. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, she let me go first. This is not a person that was particularly, um, I would say, sunny uh, disposition. It was not a sunny disposition. It was someone who kind of seemed a little bit like they were having a tough day. And, uh, and so I think they saw the silliness in the, in the situation. Let me go ahead of them. But to me, that was like one of the first times I noticed this phenomenon in action and it kind of blew my mind. Uh, and it was, and it was really cool. So that's one example of this. And then this is a specific 
you know, idea or te- is it a technique? I don't fucking know. I hate the idea of like anything being a technique. It just sounds so manipulative. No, it does sound like manipulation. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> um, so yeah, so I'm definitely open to anyone else's ideas uh, or experiences in how this works. Cause like, I don't know in the South, like we're really accustomed to manipulation. We guilt the shit out of people <laughs> you know, like, and each other in order to make things happen. It's just what it is. It's like part of the thing. Um, but I don't, I don't consider this to be really manipulation. Um, this to me seems like more like putting other people's, uh, needs and values or at least being aware of them. Cause he even talks about how you can visualize them getting the things that they want. And that itself is frailing. Yeah. And that's the whole because it's really an energetic thing if you think of it everything as an energy exchange then you know you're 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 putting out the energy so it's kind of like reiki which is energy healing right but you can do the same idea if you have a meeting with somebody and you're afraid it's going to go bad then think about that person freaking what do they love to do do they love to freaking go fishing and stuff imagine them having a great fishing trip you know and and visualize it really well and then before you meet with them they're going to be way more just like it'll go better than you think and so you can do this it doesn't have to be fishing it doesn't have to be something like that you could just imagine yourself giving them love and comfort or whatever you know and then the next day they're going to feel more comfortable in your energy when you have to meet with them yeah. And he even talks about like <clears throat> sending basically good energy, good visualizations, good vibes, if you will, to, uh, to people just for even for no reason. I'll take, you know, I, it's, it's almost like a form of prayer even I would say like, but just visualizing positive things for people. Like, let's say that you had a, uh, um, like, a, um, a show, you know, and then I just visualize you having an awesome show you know, and I'm sending you great energy, great vibes, visualizing that and putting that out there. It is helpful. He's saying that does, it does add to the energy, the energy, there is an infinite amount of free energy. And you're basically impressing that image onto, onto energy, if that makes sense. Yeah. Well, and he says you can do really the same thing at like a party. Like if you sit there you sit there and activate your it's i mean same thing it's different actually but it's the same idea the energy of it all so if you activate your meridians and you know have your fountains going all around you you can imagine it spreading out to the, all the people around you and you can affect the energy of everyone there like make them happier make them in a good mood make them more you know friendly and um he said try it do it no don't try it just do it Yeah, just do it. Like, yeah, absolutely. I mean, just thinking about other people, you know what I mean? I think that puts I think that puts us ahead of 99% of people, you know, and just taking a second. It's like the analogy of the fly against the window, the fly against the window pane, the fly against the window pane. And then you zoom out and then you notice that the other window's completely open. He's talking a little bit in here about jobs and about like, even if you go in and you have an interview, you could be the perfect candidate, but you might screw yourself out of getting the job by being the perfect candidate. If you're not, if you're not thinking about what the interviewer themselves really needs, right? Like they need the best candidate for the job based on the criteria they need to fill. So you could actually be perfect for it and not really demonstrate that you're exactly what they need the interviewer and then still not get the job. Yeah. So, and then to take it a step further, he's talking about when you write your resume, you should always research the, which I, I have done this. So maybe I, maybe I took it in when I read this chapter, maybe you just knew it instinctively. I don't think so. I think I got it from real. I must've got it from reality transurfing and just didn't realize it that I was frailing, but when you write your resume and stuff, don't, don't embellish your, don't lie about your bad qualities because they're going to show. And that's like, that's a importance thing, right? You're always going to make, they're always going to show. So you don't, 
lie about those, you know, don't it, like try to give yourself a skill set you definitely don't have because you'll end up having to demonstrate that. But research the company. What are their values? What are their, you know, what are their core statements? What are they, you know, what are they about? Um, and then you need to reflect that in your resume. And the same idea, you know, with the person interviewing you, if you know anything about them, you need to know, like you could, should ask what they're looking for. And then whatever they're looking for, that's what you write into your resume. <laughs> yeah, that's smart. I mean, that's pretty clever, you know. Um, that's just doing some research too, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, that's so smart. I love that. Um, let's it see. is just research, but I mean, it is. It's. I guess that's a. But that's kind of what frailing is, right? What does the other person need? How can I help them to get that or make them feel like they could get it? And then by doing that, how is that going to benefit me? Yeah. Or how could it possibly benefit me? Yep. In this human behaviors class I took when I was a psychology major, that was one of the biggest statements was that no act is completely unselfish like everything you do is selfish i tend to agree i think i, I think for the most i think it can be that you do some unselfish acts but 99 percent are because even if you're doing uh something for somebody else a lot of times it's for your own vanity for your gratification yeah like, if yeah. i buy you flowers that's because i want you to be happy with me isn't that really because like maybe you're I guilty you flowers <laughs> yeah <laughs> but you know exactly exactly how's it gonna make me look exactly right? one of the things he talks okay. about in this chapter that's uh really interesting too is argument like getting into an argument and being right um you know and how that doesn't really help you to because whenever you whenever you are right and you sort of demonstrate your authority or that you knew better or whatever, you kind of make an enemy out of the person and you hurt their self-worth instead of um, really making your point. Even, even if you do make your point and you're right, he's like, you still lose the argument because you have alienated someone and made an enemy out of them. And it does because subconsciously the next thing that happens is they go home, they know they lost the argument, but then they think of all the ways that they were valid and that they were right. And so then, yeah, they're never like consciously, it's never going to be right between you two. Yeah. I've had people sometimes tell me that I should push back <clears throat> more on the show. Like when I have different people on the show who are like coming to talk about whatever i've had some crazy people on the show i've had you know alien ufo researchers and people who are kind of maybe even clearly selling some sort of a snake oil you know what i mean it's like you know do you push back on that what's the what's the positive that can come out of it maybe some drama on your youtube channel you know what i mean <laughs> Maybe it's a little bit more uh, contentious or uh, there's a little bit of uh, controversy, I guess, is the thing that could happen with that. And for me, though, I don't see the point really, for the most part, in challenging people too much, at least on this show. I mean, I'm, I'm open to have like a, a rousing debate about something that I think is important or if everybody's on board for that and people have thick skin and they can, you know do that but i'm like what is the point i also grew up uh, listening to coast to coast am and george nori and art bell before him really art bell was i fell in love with i still like george nori but but you know he would let people talk about whatever it was you know what i mean <laughs> even if they were like wackadoo man like we would, ha it would have some crazy talks about some of the stuff that used to be on coast to coast back in the night. I mean, they would have people call in from the future when they had open lines, people talk about werewolves and vampires and all kinds of stuff. And I'm all for the exploration of, of different things. And then also just like we're talking about now, if you 
want to prove someone wrong, then I don't know, what does that really add to the interaction? You know, maybe a little bit of temporary uh, friction and, <clears throat> and drama, but ultimately what, what really good is that? It kind of takes me back to the law of one because the law of one says, you know, if you choose the path of service to others, you only have to be 51% service to others. And I think that is because it is so hard to be genuinely unselfish. And, I, I, but I mean, I think most of us want to be more of service to others, but I think that's why it's, it says that if you choose the service to, to, to self path, you have to be like very negatively polarized, like 98% or something, 99%. And I really think that's because it's so easy to be selfish versus like being a little bit more than halfway concerned with other people. Well, I think it's gotta be almost actually hard to be that selfish. You know what it, I'm saying? It, yeah, it's, it probably is. It's probably more difficult than I think, but I'm just saying, I do think that humanity as a whole, maybe, and I, and I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean, we're all selfish. It's okay. Like, yeah, it's yeah. okay to put yourself first. Of course. This, this is your experience, but yeah. Yeah, it is. Know. It is. Absolutely. No, I, I agree with you. I, um, I think it's interesting because it's, it's a, it's a balance. I mean, we want to have win wins, you know, we want everybody to win. I think everyone yeah. can win. And I think that's we really want what humanity to win. Yeah. The good guys. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. The good guys. And, uh, yeah, I think that's really what this chapter is about, right? It's acknowledging the fact that we are, yes, of course, selfish, self-interested, self, you know, uh, pr primarily concerned with ourselves, which, I mean, honestly, we don't own anybody else other than ourselves. So we should be, right? Like be a good steward yeah. with that. And then also looking out for the best interest of others. So it's it's not either or, it's, it's in addition to, you know, it's taking care of ourselves and by using uh, the skills and acknowledging other people, their existence, their talents, their abilities, then we can actively build them up too. And we're building ourselves up by building them up. It's a win-win. It's a um, synergistic type of relationship. I think it's really easy to just focus on yourself and try to get things from other people. And then you're not adding anything to their life you're just taking from them and they're going to get tired of that shit real fast <laughs> you're not going to get invited to hang around anymore <clears throat> yeah you're working without her intention and maybe being a asshole like an energy vampire yeah yeah and honestly i think that type of behavior now in is more prevalent than ever it's encouraged and in in a lot of places i won't say everywhere but it's just it's just culturally it's, it's very in, uh, strongly emphasized in the mainstream way of thinking and thought. And uh, it's, it's honestly, sometimes it's hard not to get swept up in it because it's just so prevalent. Yeah, it is, but I see the good too. Like I make sure that I do, you know, since I know reality is a mirror, I make sure that when I see the good things that I, that I mark them in my reality. So I continue to see them. Yeah, that's great. Just highlighting those positive things, you know, the, the good things. Um, and then that's adding right. Like inner energetically as well. Yeah, it is just like he was talking about, you know, just visualizing those things like, it's like impressing onto free energy, whatever it is that you're visualizing. So you don't have to just make slides for yourself. You know, you can make slides for other people. Um, maybe only caveats to that would be like, just be, be, be careful not to like do some witchcrafty shit, but just like mm -hmm. thinking of things that they might like or seeing them happy, you know, maybe what's wrong them, with witchcrafty shit. Well, you know, not like black magic, you know what I'm saying? Like, don't be fucking with people's <laughs> yeah. wills, you know, and like trying to like do all that. Cause we were talking a little bit about the romantic aspect of this earlier. And you know, he he's, uh, and I agree with Vadim on this. He's like, not, not into like visualizing specific people, uh, 
like I'm, this person's gonna marry me this is gonna be right. my person yeah you can't do that that's yeah it's that's it's, yeah that's, black magic that's manipulation that's black magic and so it's you know if, if, if it's something you want companionship you know, and there's nothing wrong with liking anybody, you know, and having and fancying someone or whatever. But it's like, if you're doing that as a slide, you need to do that without a specific person in mind and just see yourself, you know, happy with someone, you know, and then that's going to put, that's going to put somebody that's going to be a better practice anyway, because it's so easy to see someone as something that they're really not we it's so easy to romanticize and idealize someone when you get a crush on them you know <laughs> so you'll create this person yeah. out of them you'll create a person out of them that they're not and ultimately they'll disappoint you unfortunately but it's not even their fault they were nothing other than the person that they just were but you thought they were so much more or something you know <clears throat> anyway <laughs> and it's the same idea too though with a job it's the same exact thing so when you go and apply for a job, you know, he said, pick the job that you really want to do. That is your goal. Like, don't worry about how hard it's going to be to get it. You just, you know, play that gold slide. But then when you go and apply and stuff, um, it's the same idea of what you were talking about. Like, um, he said, first of all, don't ever send your resume more than once because if they don't see it and they don't like it, like, your your self-worth shouldn't don't damage your self-worth by freaking making yourself feel low and having to apply again like but um he goes on to say more about it um that the job if it, if it's not yours if you don't get the job like you need to look at it like that was the world saving you from something so because it was not your goal and it wasn't your door it had nothing to do with it yeah. So it's same ideas with a person. It's like you're dodging a bullet by not getting that thing. Yeah, it's really it, it can be very hard because like, I don't know what happens chemically. I, I've started like read, read a couple books. I read this one book called The Science of Kissing, which is uh, pretty interesting, uh, you know, and then some of these other just books that I find randomly and I'm like, huh, that's fascinating, you know, and like look into just s some of the different ideas about romance and stuff but you know with with that it's a different it's kind of it's just a different um process and pushing something on a certain person or attempting to uh i don't know how you would even say it coerce i guess i think it's coercion attempting to coerce somebody into something that's, that's a good not thing. Yeah. Heard, yeah yeah that's not uh that's not so instead stay open stay open to the flow of alternatives and look for what it is that that you want because ultimately what you're looking for if you're trying to get into a relationship is an internal feeling of yourself really it's a lot of i think a lot of validation sometimes unfortunately um i don't know maybe that isn't unfortunate but <clears throat> But it can be it can be unhealthy validation. Even it could be it could be like an ego um, sort of trip. But yeah, if something doesn't work out with that specific person that you have in mind or whatever, count your blessings, move on, and just instead focus on what it is that you really want. Just like the job, right? Like you want to be doing what all day. What does that look like? You know every job can have a glamorous interpretation, but if you don't actually like doing the thing that is required to do that job, then you're just going to be miserable in it. And you might have a status that comes along with it and may maybe feel proud of that, but you're not going to be enjoying that job, you know? And I think the same can be the, the that way for a partner too. It's like, you see somebody who's shiny, you're like, oh, I'd look good with them. People would think I was cool if I dated this person or something. Like, I don't even know. Like, that's so crazy. But, um, but I think that can be a motivating factor. So, if it doesn't work out, count your blessings. Just ask yourself what it is that you want. Like, what is it that you want? Why do you want to be in a, a specific sort of type of relationship? What are you trying to get out of that? What's the emotional? 
payout for you? And how can you get that whether or not you're in a relationship? So what about the whole piglet thing? What point was he trying to drive home with that? Because I mean, <laughs> I thought about bringing up the whole piglet story here, but I'm like, Really? I feel like he was kind of getting more back into balancing forces and stuff, but I'm, I don't know. Will you just give us a short, short synopsis of the piglet story? So he's, he basically said, imagine that you always have a piglet in your arm and you're carrying this piglet around and it's always squealing and making noise. And, you know, um, sometimes you need it to not do that. So eventually, you know, the only way to get it to stop is probably to set it down. But yeah i don't know what does it have to do with frailing i guess i guess like squeezing the piglet would be like driving with your inner intention and only caring about yourself instead of caring about the thing oh because that's the thing he does get into it he gets into love a little bit and he talks about that's the thing though is that love is always about it's it's coming from a, a real place it's not possession it never is possession it, that it's literally you have to remember that if you love something that f the frailing part of that is allowing them to be who they are and yeah and allowing them to walk away from you and still yeah. loving them even if they do which is the fucking hardest part right like that's what we want that's what our idea i don't know if that's more of a cultural thing or if that's more biological like i said i've been like this stuff is fascinating to me. I can't help but want to understand a little bit better. But I think, you know, that sort of lends itself to just tr like that true unconditional love. Like the example earlier in the book is not picking the flower, seeing the flower in the field and just admiring it there for what it is and not trying to pick it up and put it in a vase and watch it die. It's like instead, you know, we see something that we love cherish admire and we just admire it for the sake of the fact that we admire it and it makes us feel a certain way inside i think that's really what he's trying to point out as opposed to trying to again probably coerce or push force you know manipulate some sort of a an agreement or an arrangement to make us feel settled uh, to make us feel in control, like we are dominating that thing or um, controlling it somehow. And it's like the more that you try to take control, it's like water slipping through your fingertips. You're trying to pick up water. And the more that you're able to love unconditionally without possession, the more that people want to be a part of that. They want, and that doesn't necessarily even mean romantic, it means in all situations. If you have a heart that is capable of unconditional love, then, you know, that is frailing and people want to be a part of that. They want to feel that and they want to be like to have what you're willing to offer. And in respect, I think that you teach them what it means and so that you also get that back. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I think it ultimately, honestly, like all of life. Uh, if there was a challenge and I've, I've said this, it's been a while, but I, I kind of came to this conclusion years ago. It's like, if there is a test or some meaning of life, it's to choose unconditional love, right? If there is a test, you know, that's really to me what it would boil down to, you know, and you're going to frail naturally. If you're coming from a place of unconditional love, you're not, you have no reason to do any inner intention. It would, it wouldn't even make sense. You're not coming from a place where inner intention is part of the part of the script. It's all outer intention at that point. It is. Oof. See, I think I'm actually better at feeling than I think. I just like when I have to think about it, it doesn't feel like I do it. Well, cause that feels manipulative. I think. Yeah. Right? It's like, if you, yeah. So it almost feels it, cringy and you're like, I don't know if I want to think about this. Yeah. Ooh, you know, like I have to think about like what kind of, you know, uh, vacation this guy wants to have. 
or whatever. Yeah. I like the idea of sending people energy though. Like I'm going to practice that a lot more. I'll take because all even it. though it's self, like, <laughs> yeah, it is, well, that's what I'm saying. It doesn't even have to be selfish. It doesn't even have to do no. anything with me. I can just do it, you know? Well, honestly, so. I had a practice that I would do um, every morning, you know, and especially so a couple of years ago where I would just think of people that I loved. It didn't have to be even a person could be a pet, an animal, whatever, something that you love. Just like I would wake up in the morning, immediately think of that, you know, whatever that is. And it would inspire that feeling inside of me, you know, that person that I admired or adored or loved. It could be anybody, my grandfather, or like I said, like a cat, an old cat we had or something, who knows. And then just begin to just focus on that. <clears throat> Now, all of a sudden, you are putting yourself into that uh, energy of unconditional love, or at least a deep love, even if it is conditional, and radiating that out and start to think of other people and send those salutations, you know, to them, whatever. And but I mean, but it's also a win win because you're getting the benefit of having those emotions and feeling really good inside of your body true yeah that would be the payoff huh so yeah so like a gratitude list one of the things that people talk about the most that people miss on a gratitude list is they write all the stuff down that they really are grateful for but then they forget to feel the gratitude it's like that's the you know, point <laughs> yeah well i used to start like that you know like do a list of the things i wanted to do a gratitude list but what it evolved to and i noticed like i've actually just noticed myself doing this recently like i started just doing it right when i woke up before i got out of bed i do just say out loud like all these things that i'm grateful for well i thought i stopped doing it but the other morning i don't know probably like two months ago i noticed when i woke up like for whatever reason my conscious mind kicked on and i was doing gratitude without even like and i was feeling it because it's like my soul is straight coming out of like the dream state and i'm just happy as can be and i'm just like giving all this gratitude i don't even remember what i was saying i was thankful for that's kind of like the amazing part of it all is that if you make it less of a practice and you know just start doing it it's crazy what what you do what practice what is with. boring practice sucks play is fun it is and yeah, I'm trying to shift my language a little bit too. It's like I got to work on my act. It's like, well, that doesn't sound fun. Sit down and work on a comedy act. I'm like, yeah. Yeah. Why would you like want to do that? It'd be fun to play with your act, though. You know, that's a good time. You know, so sometimes little shifts like that can definitely help too. But that, I mean, that helped me. And I and I just do morning pages now is what I've done for probably the past three, right around three years. And uh, I don't know, I might start doing the other thing again. I might just change something else and doing that shit for three years. It's a long time. Well, it's funny that you said that, though, about <clears throat> like play instead of practice, because I guess that's an example is that when I was a classroom teacher, like this would be an example of frailing. But if you can make learning fun and you turn it into a game, like because what do my students want? They don't want to sit here with a freaking textbook and listen to me lecture and they don't want to take notes and they don't want to learn per se but if i make it a game i i taught grammar that's like the most boring subject in the world but it was so fun that my kids love my class every kid that i see like now that's in high school that had me as their grammar teacher is like you are the best teacher You're like you always you know i'll, I'll never forget your class and it's because i made sure that learning didn't feel like a chore so that would be frilling yeah absolutely what does a kid want a kid wants to have fun run around have a good time play yeah. play a game so you turn learning into a game now all of a sudden you know it's win-win they're having it fun is. they're getting what they want and then you're doing what you need to do you're getting your needs met as well so that's a great example of it i love that yeah in houston actually we're going to go through and do some uh we're going to be messing with the forks, you know? And so we're going to go and meet some folks in a class and play with the forks a little bit and do some vibrational stuff there. And I'm excited about that. So we'll try and make it, I'll try and think of, of, of a fun game to incorporate with it to make it a little bit more entertaining and engaging. That's fun. 
It's super know. fun. Super fun. I'm sure you can think of something. Oh, yeah. For sure. Yeah, I'm really excited. Uh, but yeah, I think, yeah, I mean, dude, I, unconditional love, it trumps any technique. It does. What And if you can actually truly love someone unconditionally, which I'm not saying that's easy. But if you can, he's like, dude, no one can find that. It's irresistible. No one can find that anywhere else. You know, if you can, it's just, I, I don't know. It's like, it's interesting to love without attachment, you know, but because I don't know if it's a cultural thing again, back to that. I don't know if it's more cultural or more biological, the idea or need, need to feel like you possess. Uh, it might be hormonal based on our biology. You know what I'm saying? I don't know, but um, being able to overcome that and to truly just love someone for who they are, regardless of how they, because if you, because if you place conditions on it, it becomes a conditional relationship. Now it's out of balance and it always yeah. will be. Yeah. A lot to think about, but I, I really think that's the ultimate aim here, right? Come from a place of unconditionality, unconditional love. Allow everyone to be exactly as they are. Allow yourself to be exactly as you are. And then this idea of frailing will sort of take care of itself and outer intention yeah. too. Even with people you think are assholes, because you can still love them. <laughs> you might not like them. You don't have to like everyone. No, we don't like everyone. There's a reason yeah. that it wouldn't be right if we did. There's too many people in the world. You know, you got to, we have, yeah. we have certain preferences and I don't know. Some of that stuff might be pheromonal and chemical uh, as well, you know, um, which is fascinating. Well, all this stuff. Clearly it's got to be like the whole possession thing. I've wonder if it kind of stems from the whole Abrahamic religions really being very male dominant. I'm not saying, but female are possessive. Females are possessive too, so it's not exactly true. Yeah, I, I was just, thinking, I was just kind of working through it, and I realized I'm wrong. So, no, it's fine. I mean, dude, it's that whole thing is so fascinating to me. It's kind of a, a new um, area of study, I would say, because from what I understand, if you read a uh, book about like sex at dawn, then you know we can see that society was matriarchal. They didn't even know that there was a causal link between sex and pregnancy. Yeah. Right. So they all just worship the feminine. Everybody's just having sex with each other and babies are just basically just falling out all the time. Right. And so no one really understands that if this is, you know, this is one theory, one idea, I don't know if it's true or not, but then as we became more agricultural, then we became more patriarchal and then it became more possessive. Um, and there were probably a lot of needs that were being fulfilled by that evolution, you know? And so now we live in this modern world and we still have this old wiring, biological wiring that we had from thousands of years ago, but we live in a modern world. So our needs from a biological level are the same, but our needs in the modern world are completely different. So even within the past hundred years, look how much, you know, society and culture has changed just through, since the industrial revolution. Um, but anyway, so it's fascinating to me on that front. But again, if you have, if you can learn to adapt or adopt a disposition grounded in unconditional love, I mean, what else? You don't need anything else. That's that is yeah. winning. That is winning the lottery. You know, <laughs> that's as good as that's as good it as is. I think you can do, you know, and that's what I think n all the spiritual books are really talking about. That's what, what else could enlightenment be other than just unconditional love? Just seeing everyone as a fractal of God. Yeah, because when you do, then you recognize yourself in them, even if they're totally weird. <laughs> you just appreciate it i think well for me you know it's like that whole idea of like manifest a parking spot or whatever mm -hmm. you know i i don't see it that way at all i really see it as coming from an emotional 
place of uh, bounty, gratitude, appreciation. And then I always get good parking spots. I mean, especially when I'm driving around setting up shows and I've got a PA in my car and a bunch of lights and benches and chairs and all this kind of stuff. They just open up. It's weird. I'll just be driving down the road and somebody will back out right near where I need to park, you know, and it's not because I manifested one parking spot. It's just my world takes care of me, you know? I'm just coming from yes, that place. Yeah. And so when I need whatever it is that I need, there it is. It's just, it's there. It is there. Paranoia. I don't know. Yeah, I just, oh, actually, Becky just sent me that and I put it on my story. Hold on. I'll tell you what it means. But it totally reminds me of um, the alchemist. Paranoia, the opposite of paranoia, is the belief that everything in the universe is conspiring to support you. Pronoia. Pronoia. Yes. Pronoia. Yeah. That's the whole book. It is. <laughs> <laughs> Period. We summed it up in a sentence. That's a yeah. shorter summary than yours. That's a single word. All right. I'm going to put that on audible. You know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> thank you for reading the book. But, uh, but yeah, that's a great word. I love that. And that is, uh, yeah, really, really cool. Um, cool chapter. We're going to get into, uh, coordination next. I'm going to be gone this week, so we won't do one on whatever the ninth. We will do one on that would be the 16th. So we'll skip next week. But while I'm gone and out, I'm going to try and at least put out a couple of videos. So, you know, once again, if y'all have anything you can think of that could be a cool topic to cover, something you're curious about or have an idea about or whatever, shoot me a message. Um, I'm open to all kinds of stuff. Um, there's a lot, there's a lot in here. I feel, I feel like I can make a bajillion trans serving videos. I could just probably never stop making them, but I, I know. Wanna, huh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I want to, um, but I want to make the ones that count, you know, I want to make the ones that people want to watch, right? Like from a, from a frailing and outer intention perspective, you know, like I do get a lot out of making the content. It helps, it helps my knowledge. It deepens my knowledge. Um, but I also want to make sure that it's something that's helpful for people. Where am I going? Oh, well, I'm so glad you asked Ryan. Mm -hmm. I am going on tour. I'm headed to the panhandle of Panama city, Florida, then over to new Orleans, Louisiana for two nights of comedy, then over to Grimerica's Eclipse at the Canyon in Utopia, Texas for two nights, and then Austin, Texas for two nights, and then Houston, and then Panama City, Florida for two nights on the 12th and 13th, and I will be headed back home after that, but I'll be doing some comedy, making some videos, hanging out, meeting some amazing people along the way, and... Uh, yeah, I'm really excited about it. It's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be a big adventure road trip. Who doesn't love a great road trip? And I get to do some comedy I'm featuring in New Orleans. I got three shows there. And then, uh, yeah, and then I'll be making my way across Texas and back and uh, looking forward to it. Do you know the name of the venue in pa Panama City? Yeah, one is, one is Mosey's and the other one is Little Village. So... I'll be posting more stuff and also on Instagram. I'll try and if y'all are on Instagram, I don't know. I, I probably some of y'all are I'm probably more active on that platform than anywhere else personally. Um, but Same. I'll be making YouTube videos too. So if you don't already follow me on Instagram, follow me over there. I'll, I'll try and document my travels over there too. you know, making a little short video stories and stuff like that. Um, but I'll make some longer form videos for YouTube and just basically, I want to talk about concepts. I don't want it just to be about, Hey, I'm going here and I did this and look at this thing, you know? Um, but I will share some of that stuff on Instagram. It's shorter form content, you know, it's like little stories and stuff like that. I like to put pretty flowers and stuff in my story. Anyway, when I, when I'm walking around, I'll see trees blooming or 
birds chirping or whatever. And I'll throw that up there. Um, I, uh, I don't have, I have one GoPro, but it's old. So I don't think I'll be using that too much. Uh, I'm using my phone and then I've got a Sony camera that, uh, that also I'll be shooting some stuff with, but yeah, we're stopping at the, what people claim to be the fountain of youth tomorrow, Ponce de Leon Springs in Florida. And then I'll be on the beach. I'll make a video on the beach in Panama city beach. Uh, this next couple of days, then we'll shoot over new Orleans, then near San Antonio for the Grand America thing, then Austin, Houston, and back to Panama city. So if y'all are anywhere around those parts, hit me up, uh, shoot me a message and, uh, love to hang out and see you and hang out and make sure that you kick it on the secret society of good guys streams on Fridays. Abby, tell everybody about what y'all are doing. Um, <clears throat> we like to shoot the shit last week. We shot the golden shit, but <laughs> that's just the name of our episode. So if you're not already liked and subscribe to Secret Society of Good Guys. We usually pick a topic um, and we run with it. We dress up because we like to be fun like that. And we get into the philosophy of it. We get into conspiracy. We talk about there's no limits. We don't have any limits. We don't, we lean in. So whatever we're talking about, it gets weird and we like it weird. Weird is fun. So we usually run about four hours on Friday nights and we do another little two hour live stream with just the secret society of good guys, girls. Um, and that one's a primetime show. So we do it from like nine to 11, I would say central standard time. So, so yeah, check it out. Yeah, check it out. Check it out, folks. And thanks so much for hanging out with us today. I hope you got something out of this stream. I enjoyed it. I think we kind of came to a a really good conclusion. Because like I said, you know, this is a uh, chapter, this this technique, if you will, is something I have to feel like I I haven't practiced enough. I'll, I'll reach out to a lot of people and say, hey, you know, what's going on? I run rooms in Athens and I'm looking for a spot on your show. It's like I'm, I'm leading off with value, trying to give someone what it is that they might want first, you know, and doing those types of things. Um, but it's not something that I feel like I've mastered the art of at, at all, as far as it goes. But that said, when we come from that place of unconditional love, uh, it's kind of more, more of an automatic thing. It's not something that I think we have to yeah. try to like strategize about. It's like, you know, and it's okay to ask for things too. He, one of the things that he says, he talks about gypsy hypnosis in this chapter too. I forgot to mention. Oh, that. he does. Yeah. 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 Whenever you get on and you start to talk to somebody, then if you can get them to say yes, two or three times, then they'll already be predisposed. You can ask simple questions and get simple yeses, but they'll already be in that mindset and they'll be open and more likely to say yes. <clears throat> So that's definitely something to keep in mind. The old gypsy hypnosis. And uh, oh, there was one other thing I wanted to mention that he talked about in the book and, or in this chapter. Um, but I can't remember what it is now. I forgot it. But anyway. You took good notes this week too, I see. <laughs> 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 yeah. But yeah, no, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, it was really good. Unconditional love. I mean, if you come from that place, whatever. You got no, you got nobody to apologize to. You got nobody to try to impress. Whatever, dude, you know, the dude abides, I guess, if you will, sort of thing. Okay. Word. Word. All right. <laughs> Thanks everybody. What a lively chat. Y'all are amazing. Thanks so much for being here. You're, you're great. And we appreciate you. Uh, like I said, I'll be shooting out a couple of videos over the next couple of weeks. Um, so I will be doing stuff. So be checking back, but we will have, we will have Abby and I back together on the, I think that would be the 16th, the 16th of April. So we will be back in two weeks. So we're not, we're just, we're not, you know, we're just taking a, a short minute because I'll be on it's the a hiatus. Yes. It's a, like a mini hiatus. It's like the cutest, tiniest, 
teeniest hiatus that's ever been taken. It's not even. Really What's it called on a TV show when they like kind of do a little pause before they finish the rest of the season? I don't know. Like they do like. <laughs> Like, a like they'll do it like the back when you used to have to watch a TV show, wait every week. Then like you know, ten weeks in, they decide to just do a recap, everything. Yeah, and you don't get a new episode. You have to wait. That's fun. Just it's just more edging. That's what we're doing. We're edging. Yeah, that's, that's what it's called. <laughs> you want more, baby? <laughs> that's right. But yeah, I don't know. Maybe I'll try to sum up some of the stuff we've talked about in one of the videos. But I'm really excited to see the Fountain of Youth. It looks really pretty. It should be gorgeous. I mean, it's spring now. So some of the videos that I shoot should look really cool just for the sheer fact that everything's in bloom. So, um, so yeah, so check back. Thank you so much for hanging out with us. You guys are amazing. Much, much love and many, many blessings to each and every one of you and all the people around there. I'm, I'm frailing you hard right now, everybody. <laughs> Same. Um, just <laughs> visualizing uh, everybody chilling in a, in a quantum hammock, you know, with their dreams coming true. Um, <laughs> just a nice cool breeze and um, a sunny, clear day. All right. <clears throat> we'll see you guys very, very soon. Much love. And yeah, please pass this along. If you enjoyed it, share it out, like it, comment, join the telegram, join the Facebook group. If you're on there and thank you so much. We'll see y'all soon. Peace. Bye.